It's now time for member statements. I recognize the member for Oshawa. Speaker, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time at our local public library. I loved to read and discover and explore, and the library was a huge part of my foundational learning, as it is for many children. Libraries across the province are hubs and homes to everyone, to those who have a need to read, to use the internet for learning or work, to those who use the maker spaces to create and invent and imagine, to those who need somewhere warm and safe and quiet and welcoming. Libraries are hearts of every community. They are community. This Premier has unbelievably set his sights on our library system. He is wrong to attack people's access to library services. This budget cut 50 per cent of the provincial funding to the Southern Ontario Library Services, known as SALS, as well as to OLS North. This affects interlibrary loan between different library systems as well as training and organizational supports. Not every library has every book or resource ever written. So SALS is a centralized, coordinated organization that delivers across the province to different libraries. SALS coordinates and facilitates when a class needs 20 copies of a book, or a senior needs more large print books than their library has, or a student is working on distance education, or someone needs an out-of-print book for research, or if a visually impaired client needs a book on CD. Homebound patrons, homeschooled children, and academics will no longer have access to collections beyond their backyard. This government talks about wanting to centralize systems and be more efficient. Well, here's a perfectly good functioning example, and they're scrapping it. Smaller communities, remote, and First Nations communities will be hit the hardest. And why? This Premier is nickel and diming this province to ensure families and folks will have less access to books, resources, learning, and libraries. Shame. Member statements. The member for Markham Thornhill. Mr. Speaker. I rise today with an extremely heavy heart to speak to the horrific loss of life in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday. We know now that over 200 men, women and children were killed in this inhumane and indiscriminate act of terror. Unfortunately, we also know that advance warning were provided of imminent attack in Sri Lanka that were not acted on. As a former political refugee from Sri Lanka, this event has deeply impacted me and my family and thousands of Sri Lankan diaspora living in Canada. Such acts of terrorism have no place in civilized society and more so when committed on holiday of Christian. All too often we see such acts of terrorism and violence across the world at churches, temples, mosques, and recently at the synagogue in the United States. These tragic circumstances remind us that hate, racial strife, and merciless killing remain a threat to the democracy, religious freedom, and social justice across the world. Mr. Speaker, we must all stand in solidarity and speak with a unified voice against this heinous crime and reject divisiveness and hate. Today, the world is mourning. As we mourn and keep the lives lost in our prayers, we must also seek redemption of unity love and compassion for those of all faith and background. We must continue to stand for society that ensure the freedom to practice our faith and to live our life without fear. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to stand today in this House to speak about the Niagara Folk Arts Multicultural Centre. It is an agency that is near and dear to my heart, not only for the important work they do, but because I spent eight years as the executive director of this organization before being elected to this house. The Niagara Folk Arts is a community-based, non-profit, charitable organization whose team of over 40 professional staff and hundreds of volunteers provide vital settlement services to newcomers as they strive to create a rewarding new life in Canada. Niagara is home to the Niagara Folk Arts Festival, the oldest continuously running heritage festival in Canada. Every May, the multicultural community opens its doors and its heart and welcomes you to experience the beauty and uniqueness of their cultures, traditions, art, music, and food, including games, exhibitions, and live entertainment. This year's festival runs from May 2nd to the 26th and features over 20 open houses across the Niagara region. Over the last five years, the Folk Arts has welcomed many Syrian refugee families to Niagara, helping them to settle and integrate. These families have now founded a group called Syrians in Niagara and have started their own open house, teaching their new community about their experiences and showcasing their culture. I'm very proud of them. 
To learn more about the festival and schedule of open houses, please go to the Niagara Folk Arts Festival or folk-arts.ca. Thank you. With the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. Today I rise to speak about the horrific Easter Sunday bombings in Sri Lanka and to honor the victims and their families. I would like to begin by thanking all my colleagues and the people across Ontario who participated in the dozens of vigils throughout the province. Words simply cannot express the depth of my grief of, at this horrific attack, and my prayers are with those who perished and their loved ones. I have said this before, I'll say it again. Violence of any kind is unacceptable. Discrimination of any kind is absolutely intolerable. I fled a brutal genocide perpetuated by the Sri Lankan state and military. Vicious targeted attacks against ethnic and religious minorities have been prevalent in Sri Lanka for many years. So these events affect me very personally. Innocent children, women, men who just want to celebrate Easter, a joyous festival, in Christian calendar will never be able to do so again. And the memories of the survivors will forever be marred by this tragedy. As we approach the 10 year anniversary of the height of the Tamil genocide, we must reaffirm our commitment to fight crimes against humanity and to strive justice and peace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Statements, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Abigail Lobsinger is six years old. She lives with a rare and aggressive childhood cancer, stage four neuroblastoma. For treatment, she endures an aggressive plan of chemotherapy, radiation, surgeries, and blood transfusions. As you can imagine, her illness has caused emotional and financial strain on her family. Cancer has made it difficult for Abigail to gain and maintain weight, so doctors prescribed a tube feed supplement to help her maintain a healthy weight. Her feed costs $437 per case at a rate of one and a half cases per week. Annually, that's over $34,000. Abigail's feed was covered under OHIP Plus, but as of April 1st, it is no longer covered. When Abigail's parents went to pick up her feed this month, they were told that they needed to pay out of pocket. The feed isn't covered under their private insurance plan either. This government has pulled the rug out from under families by changing to changes to OHIP Plus without warning and without consultation. The changes to OHIP Plus were made without considering who would fall through the cracks. And it seems that kids like Abigail weren't considered at all. This government needs to get their priorities straight and cover the nutritional feed through the OHIP Plus for kids like Abigail and so many others. Abigail needs to be a priority for this government. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member Statements. The Member for Ottawa South. Speaker, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to, to make a Member Statement today in the independent slot. Member for Ottawa South is seeking unanimous consent of the House to make a statement at this time in the independent spot. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues. And I simply want to echo the words of my colleagues from Scarborough Rouge. Park and Markham Thornhill and express uh, my deepest, my family's deepest, our party's deepest condolences to all the families that were affected by the Sri Lankan bombing on Easter Sunday. It's really a horrific event that's affected the lives of many, many families, not just in Sri Lanka, but here in Canada and my community of Ottawa South. And I also wanted to extend my condolences to those families affected by the uh, the shooting at the Shabbat, uh, uh, the Shabbat of Poway Synagogue in San Diego. You know, it's um, you know we just had New Zealand a little while ago and Pittsburgh six months ago, and it seems every couple of weeks we're standing up and we're or we're tweeting out something about uh, about something that's happening in the world. And you know, these acts of hate they're they're ferocious, they're almost instant, and we live in a global village and we're all affected by it. 
I think what's really important for us to understand that whether it's anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-any race, we don't just have to stand up when things happen in the world and say this is wrong. It's when those small acts happen, when synagogues or churches are defaced or mosques are defaced or people utter words, we all have to speak up. It's important for us to do that. And I want to thank again my colleagues for the time and thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. It's an honour to rise to speak about a very special event that recently took place in Brantford. On April 13th, the Kiwanis Club of Brantford had the opportunity to celebrate its 100th anniversary. Having been chartered in 1919, the Brantford Kiwanis Club is the third longest serving club in Canada. And since that time, the club has served the communities of Brantford and Brant through the volunteerism of its members, exceptional outreach activities, and through many different projects. These projects include some great community fundraisers to, that go to support organizations such as the Brant Community Health Services, Stedman Hospice, and many, many more. Through projects like these, the Kiwanis Club of Brantford has shown its continued support and dedication to the people of Brantford and Brant. In addition to local community-oriented activities, the Brantford Kiwanis Club has also worked with Kiwanis International by participating in large projects, such as the Eliminate Project, whose goal is to wipe out maternal and neonatal tetanus and the Sustaining Iodine Deficiency Disorders Elimination Project. Speaker, in the 100 years since it has been chartered, the Kiwanis Club of Brantford has shown a continuous commitment to making the world a better place, both locally and around the world. And so I would invite everyone to join with me in congratulating the Kiwanis Club of Brantford on their 100th year anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Timmins. Well, Mr. Speaker, yet again, the community of Kaseshawan is being evacuated. This is like 17 years of evacuation time and time again. We spend millions, tens of millions of dollars each year to move community members out of Kaseshawan into Timmins, Kappas Gasing, Cornwall, and different points in between. And there's what really is galling and what is really frustrating the community is that there's been an agreement signed between the First Nation, the province of Ontario, and the federal government to move the community. I was there when I was the member for Kaseshawan, as the former member for Timmins Janes Bay, when we did the signing three years ago. And the idea was that we start immediately towards starting to do what needs to be done to move that community to higher ground. Mr. Speaker, this is not rocket science. We've done it before. When Winisk was flooded and people died, we moved that community to higher ground. We no longer hear of having to evacuate anybody out of the old witness, now called Pewanik. Why? Because we put him on higher ground. I call on this government to live up to its agreement. We were signatures not only to Treaty 9, but we're also signatures to the agreement between the community of Kisachuan, the federal government, and ourselves to move that community to higher ground. Let's get it done. Let's put people where they should be on higher ground so they no longer have to live in fear when it comes to going to bed at night because their community will be flooded. Thank you. The next statement, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to take a moment to talk about some wonderful student leaders in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. Students at Bishop Alam Academy, a Toronto Catholic District School in Etobicoke, have been working hard to raise money for a wonderful cause. Bishop Allen's SLAM team, which SLAM stands for Student Leaders and Mentors, set an ambitious goal for themselves. Their goal was to raise $6,000 with the aim of providing 32 bicycles for students in need at an elementary school in Toronto. And Speaker, I am so pleased to report that these hardworking students met their goal and over a week ahead of schedule. In fact, tomorrow, April 30th, Bishop, Bishop Allen's school will be welcoming fourth and fifth grade students from Lord Dufferin School for the big bike giveaway. These bikes will give, be given to those first new students to enjoy so they can enjoy the freedom and independence just in time for the warm weather. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Sophie Constantinino for telling us about this great initiative. And I also want to thank all the students and the staff and the volunteers and the donors who made Bishop Allen's fundraiser such a success. 
I am so very proud to represent the riding with such exceptional students and student leaders like these students. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. April is Cancer Awareness Month. Nearly one in two Canadians are expected to be diagnosed with some form of cancer during their lifetime, while one in four are expected to die from it. Bien qu'un nombre croissant de Canadiens survit. More and more Canadians receive a cancer diagnostic, and it is the main cause of death in Canada. It affects people from all walks of life and all backgrounds and all professions, and this House is no exception. Many who are in this House today have been affected by cancer, including many who once served this province as MPPs. Mr. Speaker, liver cancer is on the rise in Ontario. Every year, 2,500 Canadians are diagnosed with liver cancer, and 1,200 will die from this disease in 2019. For more information, please visit SurvivorNet.ca. Mr. Norman Jamieson, an MPP for Norfolk County in the 35th Parliament, was taken by liver cancer too soon on October 3, 2017. Earlier today, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, along with Norm's daughters, Carrie, Shannon and Eileen, and his wife Sharon, along with survivors and caregivers, hosted a legislative reception. Thank you to all my colleagues for attending. It gave us an opportunity to pause, to reflect, and to share how cancer affects us all, and to honour the life and memory of MPP Jameson. Together, we can be a strong voice and advocates for liver cancer patients and all cancer patients in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our members' statements for this afternoon.